think you had your mic on a couple of minutes ago, Dolores. So if you want to, um, just like... Um, no, she doesn't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think she did have uh, her mic on a couple oh. of minutes ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm muted, yeah. If you don't want to talk, that's okay. Yeah. No problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Egley, I sent you some chats. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm reading just now. Okay, now we're actually, I wasn't recording before, but I am now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. So maybe, um, Egle. Yes. Oh yeah, so, hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't, maybe I'm gonna stop this recording, pause. Okay, okay so uh, what we have been talking about the last uh, five, more than five minutes is Rula's work on a common European framework of reference for languages project that is trying to establish, trying to create levels below levels below A1. And we were asking her about uh, oral proficiency because um, oral proficiency is more or less the topic of this module. And what she said was that word frequency was going to play a role, memorized chunks was going to play a role in assessment in the descriptors and uh, single words rather than entire sentences. So I think this will be familiar to people, to anyone who works with lower level, beginning level adult immigrants um, my work on organic grammar, the learners who were at the lowest levels quite often produced single words. And um, the same is true for the, the learners that Egle has worked with. Um, you can actually now read Egle's, um, an excerpt really, or a, a summary of Egle's research um, mm -hmm. on Italian, Italian immigrants to Italy from various parts of Africa and parts of the rest of the world. And maybe she can summarize that in, in just a second. But um, I wanted to, of course, note that um, immigrants, particularly maybe low literate immigrants, if they're not learning from textbooks because they, they can't read yet, they might start out at this particular very low stage of development and stay at it. So the lowest stages in or the lowest uh, parts of the basic variety or organic grammar stage one, maybe even below stage one. But of course, all of us, when we try to speak uh, foreign languages, um, we go to a country where we have no knowledge of the language, we're gonna speak in single words too. So I think it's always important to remind ourselves that these stages are not unique to low literate immigrant adults. How, if you're dealing with a class of highly educated people, they're gonna try to memorize long sentences and produce them. And of course, they might not understand what they're producing. Something like Vigatus Enin, uh, somebody who, in German, somebody who is educated can work and work and work on memorizing that. They can read it over and over and over again, but they might not be able to analyze it at all and use, V or use gate and use S and use in in the four words in that sentence separately in other contexts. So now I'm gonna ask Egley to tell us about her research because she uploaded an article <coughs> that was just published online yesterday, but probably people have not seen it yet. This will maybe inspire you to read it. It's in English, not in Italian. Okay. So tell us about your work. <laughs> yes, uh, it is more or less what you have already said because the the results of my uh, analysis of the interlanguage of the language acquired by uh, twenty uh, learners. Okay, from the beginning, I studied the, <laughs> the interlanguage development of 20 learners of L2 Italian. Uh, they um, were from uh, Africa, basically, Western Africa and from Bangladesh. 
and they were half lowly or non-literate and uh, uh, the other parts literate. And I um, followed them for one year, more or less. Uh, I recorded their speech. And uh, what I found is that uh, basically there are no differences between uh, the first development and the second de development. That is, the development of the first group and the one of the second group, apart from um, specific patterns of development. But uh, what, uh, what is really important in uh, langu second language development is just the exposure. Uh, to the target language, the, the amount of the inputs they receive. This is in, uh, in general terms what I found. So how did you collect your data and how did you tabulate and analyze it? Did you find it difficult to collect it or straightforward? Yes. Absolutely difficult. Really. Okay, so we're asking participants on this module to do something that you found difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. the, did you the, find it rewarding? Yes. Uh, okay. The difference between uh, what I did and uh, what we asked to do uh, is that I collected data not within classrooms, but uh, in a hosting center for migrants, uh, which is a completely different situation. Um, in a classroom, uh, you can. Uh, uh, I don't know, you can control what you are, what you are doing. Uh, you have uh, people who want to learn Italian. Uh. They are there for this reason and they, they are available uh, under many respects. In a hosting center, you have people who uh, are experiencing a very, very difficult life, a very difficult, uh, uh, I don't know, migration situation so it's a completely different situation what we asked to do uh, is to collect data in the classroom thus it's much more how can I say much convivial yeah 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 it's mm. easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah this is maybe the the most important diffi difficult thing I met during my research Mm. Yes, I started with a sample of learners of more than 40 people. Oh, that's then, huge. Yeah, and then I completed the research with just 20 persons uh, because I, uh, many of them uh, disappeared, basically. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They escaped, uh, they changed the country or uh, they simply weren't uh, uh, available to, mm -hmm. to meet me. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very complicated this. <laughs> but when you, when you, um, when you, when you started analyzing your data, mm -hmm. um, what were the difficulties you experienced? Oh, Okay, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the, the most difficult thing to do is to interpret what you have collected. <laughs> because you have uh, um, sentences or, um, how can I say, pieces of language and uh, uh, it's not obvious to understand what the learner wants to say. Hmm? You have, uh. Yeah, uh, I, I think this is not only for uh, the research with uh, low literate people, I think it's a more general uh, difficulty in uh, second language acquisition. You have at the, at the very low levels of language, you have uh, um, pieces of languages, pseudo sentences, and you mm -hmm. don't know what, how to interpret them. 
you do not mean it. Thus, uh, if you say this is a noun, this is a verb, you are trying to infer, but mm -hmm. you cannot know for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And both of us in our research have found out, have found, have discovered that learners quite often use whatever they have learned, and it might be something frequent. So here, frequency definitely plays a role, frequency that Rula mentioned earlier. Um, they might use something frequent that really does not relate to precisely what they're trying to say. Yes. Mm -hmm. So these are the, the memorized and overused chunks. Absolutely. And, and I'm going to uh, upload my article today to the resources so people can read about what we found out about in English. Okay. And again, it's, well, we sort of think that non-literate learners do this maybe more than literate learners do, but we, ha we have to say we don't have, I don't have evidence yet that they do it more frequently at a given stage. You, um, you have concluded, Egley, that learners stay longer at the, st the stage where they're overgeneralizing these longer chunks. But um, I think all learners seem to do it. Um, I think, though, educated learners are probably more conscious of doing it. And they, they know what different parts of speech are, what different word classes are. But I have to say, um, ah, this isn't going to sound good because it's going to imply that there is a deficit. But my mom had Alzheimer's about two decades ago. And she used memorized chunks to try to express herself. And I, I always wondered what it was it she was trying to say. So she was once trying to negotiate something about food with me. And she said something about Monty Python. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, what is it she's trying to say? <laughs> so these use of memorized chunks that don't quite fit is, is definitely some sort of communicative strategy. Yes, 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 yes. I yes. think Rula wants to say something. No, I think I agree with you. I think um, we do notice some similarities between literate and illiterate learners in terms of the uh, maybe stages or steps they go through. But there are also differences because like one of the main differences is um, the learning skills and the study skills are different. Yes. Although some of the um, like educated learners will use like the chunks, you're right that they are much more conscious that they're doing this. But at one point, they will be also much quicker. Uh, they will be able to break them down into like the uh, uh, single or individual words or parts of the chunks. They will realize why this chunk, for example, is used together. I think it would take much longer for the um, low literate learners to get to that stage and to be able to segment and uh, differentiate how this works. So they will be using them even sometimes in the wrong uh, context much more often than uh, the literate learners. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. A, uh, a case in point could be, maybe in Spanish is the same, I don't know. In Italian it is uh, uh, negation plus third uh -huh. of a copula. Non è? Non è? Used the uh, uh, just as a negation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and, and don't can be overused like that too. Don't and can't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we yeah. have that. I'm sure in Spanish there is something similar. So, um, what, what we are hoping, still hoping, is that people will people will find out something about the students, the learners with whom they work and share that week six. And we, we still don't know if, we have no idea actually, people have sufficient time to do this, if our instructions have been clear enough, if we're expecting too much on a fairly informal, not for credit module, <coughs> but 
I think that the excitement of this, at least for me, would be somebody shares something in Spanish, somebody else shares something in English, somebody else shares something in Turkish, somebody else shares something maybe in French. I don't think we have any French participants, but hypothetically. And we look at what people have shared and we see, oh, it's actually quite similar across languages. So the kinds of things that people have problems with are tend to be words that have no strong semantic meaning. So things like copula B, which in Spanish is ser and estar, and in Italian is essere, essere and in French is uh, être, and in German is sein. Um, that, okay, just used to connect a noun and an adjective, for example, not that difficult, but not necessarily required. So if a student, if a learner wanted to say, he is kind, they would just initially say, he kind. But when they start acquiring, when they acquire copula B is, for example, an S, an E, and uh, ist, it's easier to use that verb that way than it is to use it with another verb as an auxiliary. So much easier to say he is big than he is going. And even if the is is, is acquired in its use as a copula, he is big, learners are still going to say he going or he go rather than he is going. And that's just something fascinating about how the complexity of the target language, of the second language, operates in the same way in learners' minds. So these are adults, immigrants, low literate, one and a half year old children, one and a half, two year old children do the same things much more quickly because they got, they're getting a lot of input and a lot of interaction with their caregivers, with their parents, with their brothers and sisters. So um, we, we're hoping that people share something. We're trying to now encourage people, everybody who's enrolled on the module, regardless of whether they're currently teaching, regardless of whether they've actively been participating, we're trying to encourage people as you will have seen from the, the message we sent out recently, to share one or two sentences where there are errors. And we can do the analysis for you and say, ah, here's what your learners seem to be doing. And they seem to be doing similar things regardless of their languages, of, their, of the second languages. And also regardless of their native languages. Egle, do you have, Egle or Rula, do you have um, something to add here? <clears throat> we are talking by chat with Dolores. Oh, I see now. Yeah, well, yeah, it, of course it is. The priority and the main, like, uh, let's say, motive for most of these learners to learn is to communicate and to address their yeah. needs. Yeah, so maybe we should yeah. say what, what yeah. Dolores asks. So do we think that people can communicate? Um, do we think that communication is more important than grammar for the learner? That's one question. But the other question is, do we think that people can learn a language without being taught grammar explicitly? So Rula started answering the first one, and I think Egli and I will answer the second one, division of labor. Keep going, Rula. Yeah, uh, I agree with the, what you're suggesting, Dolores, that um, the priority for most of these learners is to communicate, is to address their daily needs. They want to know what uh, their kids are doing in school, how to talk and book an appointment, for example, with a GP. But I think, again, this will all lead us to the question about um, whether grammar and instruction in general, which is the topic for week four on the module, does facilitate this language learning process or not? How much does it contribute to this learning? Yes, the learning the language uh, when you're immersed in the community, when you're <coughs> in the country, you will be able to um, acquire oral proficiency, but is it at the level that is uh, intelligible to other 
is it at the level that will allow you to integrate and contribute to the society so i think these are the questions there's no doubt that you can still communicate even with using like single words you are still communicating <coughs> it's about like the effectiveness of this communication as you said on the long run yeah mm. Um, and in and, and answer to the, the second question, the second issue, whether people can learn grammar without explicit instruction. Well, we know that children can. Yes. Okay. Children learn their native language with no instruction at all. Doesn't mean that they can learn to read without instruction or write without instruction, but they certainly develop full native proficiency, adult proficiency, adult competence in the language that they're surrounded by. By the time they're around five years old. Um, when I started doing research back in the late 1980s, um, a bunch of people, a bunch of researchers in Germany had concluded that adults can acquire languages without instruction. So they set out to look at what's called naturalistic uh, second language acquisition. But they actually concluded that adults were different from children, that uh, adults stages and adults mechanisms were different. <clears throat> then in the late 80s, um, a bunch of people started arguing against them saying, okay, adults can acquire second languages with no instruction in grammar and they do it the same way that children do. Now, I think, again, um, we just always have to consider how little input and interaction learners get. And it might be the case that the only input and interaction that they get in the target language is inside the classroom. Um, that's always been the case, okay? Definitely always been the case, but it's actually with, with digital, the digital world, it's become worse outside the classroom. So it used to be the case 20 or 30 years ago that when you left the classroom and wandered around a given community and sat in your home, you had to watch TV in the target language. You had to listen to the radio in the target language. And you didn't have um, Facebook or WhatsApp to communicate with people in your native language. And now, as soon as you leave the classroom as a learner, your entire world can be in your native language. TV, radio, all the, all the social media that you engage in, and you can completely avoid interacting in the target language and getting any input. And I think the teacher needs to find ways to get learners, to motivate learners, to get more input outside the classroom. <coughs> It's really difficult, you know. Maybe, maybe the teacher should get all her students to marry um, native speakers of the target language. <laughs> That's some of the people who learn languages the best. Um, and this is maybe more anecdotal evidence than uh, empirical evidence, but there are a couple studies. People who marry someone not from their native language background and then go live with that person's family. But mm -hmm. uh, um, again, um, 20 or 30 years ago, it was possible to reach a high level of oral proficiency of linguistic competence in that language. And now that person is going to be going into their room and chatting or WhatsApping or Facebooking, whatever, mm -hmm. in their native language with people back home or people around the world and speak their language. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> yes, so Dolores had said, you, th um, you think it depends on the level of, of alphabetization, of um, literacy they have, definitely. Mm -hmm. Because if you imagine somebody who's literate, they can read signs, they can read adverts, they can read the newspaper, and someone who's not doesn't have that additional source of input. But I think what we also need to keep in mind is that although they're not able to read the signs, they have this recognition. Yeah, oh yeah. And particularly when we're talking about like uh, digital tools. So even if they're not literate, even those learners who are not literate, they are able to operate and work with smartphones. Oh yeah. Utilize the icons, do most of the activities that they need to that are essential. 
and um, uh, using just icons and uh, yes it's limited in terms of what they can do but they are still able to do it without um, yeah being yeah able to read yeah fully, yeah is, but just recognizing the letters at one point and this is i think one of the earliest stages even in our framework uh, we did put for example a differentiation between first being able to recognize and identify then move on to use uh, or being able to write or produce mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i think this is an, an initial stage yeah, yeah. We have it. i think but that you know the the usefulness of of um cefr and of um stages is that you know that with sufficient input learners will reach higher levels and higher stages so that that can be an aspiration for teachers tutors and and also for learners themselves so see you you are here but just get a lot more input and you will reach higher levels yes definitely yeah for sure yeah Dolores, do you have um, more questions? That's very helpful that you asked, that you made that comment. I see, ah, yeah, yeah. And you said, I think students want to learn faster to integrate their knowledge in their daily life, in their quotidian life. Yeah, definitely. Instruction has to be relevant. Yes, I think this is um, one of the things that are sometimes difficult because teachers yeah. are not experienced. They try to stick to teaching grammar, teaching in the traditional way, teaching the textbook, mm -hmm. when actually the learners want to know more about, like, how can I talk to my um, mm -hmm. kid's teacher? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can I book an appointment? So for them, the priorities are not to learn the grammar. No. The priorities are not to increase their vocabulary. It's more about like understanding and functioning. Surviving. In way. Yes, mm -hmm. surviving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else we want to talk about? Oh, a lot of things we said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Egle, um, Egle has just started a job in the Czech Republic. I think we should study her. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's moved from wonderful, warm, maybe a little bit uh, vibrating because of Etna, uh, Palermo in Sicily, to somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, Opava in the Czech Republic, <laughs> and has to learn Czech. So well, can you, do you know any Czech yet? Uh, I know five words. <laughs> okay, let's hear them. Okay, the first one is Anu which means uh, yes. Oh. The second one is pibo, which is means beer. beer. I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for surviving. <laughs> and uh, then I know dobry den. Which oh, good morning. Good morning. Yes. Good day, good day. Good day, yes. Uh, prosim, which mean, uh, means... Uh, Thank you, please. Yes, uh, no, prosim means uh, uh, please. And molem. Diki means Ooh. thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and consider this. She's living there. She has to survive. How long have you been there? Uh, I stay here for three years. No, how long have you been oh, there so I, far? Uh, I arrived uh, uh, one month ago. Okay. One month ago, she knows five words. Yeah. Or actually, you know, five words, which also include expressions. <laughs> I think this is typical of expatriates working in environments where they can speak English as a lingua franca or Italian, and Egli is teaching Italian. Yes. Yeah. I've sometimes been to countries as a tourist and not learned a single word. Yeah. I mean, as, as second language acquisition <laughs> specialists, we should be embarrassed about that <laughs> but i think this is this but we're human uh, yeah really yeah, exactly i think this brings us back to the fact that uh, if we're thinking about like uh, that language is about survival then we are able to survive without learning the language of the host country because yeah now she's using english if she didn't know english if she had a need to communicate then she will have learned actually much more or this is my impression i think yeah yeah i think i yeah. think probably after a month you would know 
if you had had to use check to survive, you'd probably know 50 words. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but not, I don't yeah. think, hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. But uh, to be honest, uh, uh, when I now um, look at a menu in a restaurant, ah. I can, I, I don't understand, but I understand the text. And uh, I can uh, differentiate between uh, the soups and uh, some kinds of meat. And uh, so I start, I started to, mm -hmm. yes. So when you go to a restaurant, do you go alone? Yes, yes. Sir. Okay, because that's very brave in a country where people don't speak your language. <coughs> mm, very good. I think you're saying that it's difficult to communicate with our students when we don't know their language. And of course, you're right. I don't think that it's easy. That's why I think we need more experienced teachers teaching low literate learners rather than the other way around because it is actually much more difficult to get your ideas, to get your instruction as a teacher across when you don't have the language, when your learners don't share, um, don't have uh, the language yeah. Yeah. inventory or like um, proficiency to yeah. understand. But I think yeah. some of the teachers, I've seen examples in the classroom where teachers were actually able to communicate their instructions to get the message across using different tools, for example, visual technology, um, gestures, body language, and they are able to survive uh, in the classroom and uh, to understand. The learners are able to understand the teachers. You know, I remember a long time ago when I was first starting to teach English, she's looking up and okay when when i was first starting to teach english and realizing that it it really does take i don't know theory of mind uh, putting yourself in someone else's place and monitoring very precisely and in detail what you're saying as a teacher because you you ask somebody to simplify their language and if they have no sense of what's simple and what's complex, they can't do it. Um, maybe they just speak more slowly, but continue to use passive or they speak more loudly. Um, but some teachers end up not speaking grammatically, um, which, I don't think is necessarily a problem if you don't do it all the time. <laughs> so let's say you're trying to get students to sit down at a table and you could say, please sit down at the table or you could say, please table sit and then demonstrate sit. Um, teachers have to not be afraid of making fools of themselves. Um, and using <clears throat> using whatever tools they have, pictures, acting out, miming. Yes, I think this is what most of the teachers as well use. Yeah, uh, use yeah, but not beginning that. teachers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, teachers who have no experience at all have an impossible time doing that. They need to. They need to learn how to do it. But I think that's also the whole point of what we, why we did this kind of um, research when we did the You Speak research mm -hmm. and where these modules came, um, the whole idea for the modules came from. Because mm -hmm. we realized after we've looked across like uh, provision in Europe that one of the main issues <coughs> that makes a difference in how um, proficient and how effective teaching is in uh, the language classroom with low literate learners is the lack of like, um, Ex like uh, training for teachers mm -hmm. on how to work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. learners and I think when we um, when we looked at uh, what skills are needed and what knowledge set is needed this is where the whole modules came mm -hmm. from because the teachers mm -hmm. said this is what they need yeah yep so Dolores you have more you're, you're really helping us in keeping discussion going by making comments and asking questions. And I know questions are definitely questions that uh, other module participants have. So maybe uh, one more question.
Egley is smiling about something. You must be reading your Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, Dolores, thank you so much for coming. And we have recorded this, and we think that we'll be able to share it with everybody on the module. Um, we're not, I'm not a techie, and I'm the one that pressed record. So uh, yeah. let's hope that, uh, hope that it's worked. Yes, but I think it should. <laughs> it does say that it's recording, so it should have so, worked now. Thanks yeah. for coming. Yeah. Thanks, Dolores. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Okay, so...